Hey everyone, welcome to the Anexapod, the official podcast for Anexnet. This is episode 3 for May 24th, 2016. I'm your host, Ned Bellavant, Enterprise Architect for Infrastructure Solutions at Anexnet, and the silver medalist in the Dominic Purcell Lookalike Contest. Here on the Anexapod, we talk technology for the enterprise, covering infrastructure, app dev, analytics, and anything else that is shiny. On this episode, we'll be talking about UNITY from EMC World, Unikernels Chase the Unicorn, and the future of infrastructure with our guest, Scott Richards of HPE. April showers bring May flowers, and May flowers bring pilgrims. At least, that's what my son tells me. It is the start of convention season, though, and we'll be making the pilgrimage to our favorite conference. Things have already kicked off with EMC World, or, excuse me, Dell Technologies World, and Interopt 2016. DockerCon is coming up in mid-June. In July, there is MS World Partner Conference and Cisco Live. VMware VMworld and Gartner fill up August, and MS Ignite and Oracle Open World polish off the year in September. I'd love to go to some or all of these, but alas, funding is limited, and so is my time. I'll make it to MS Ignite this year, and hopefully that will coincide with the formal release of Server 2016. What conferences are your favorites? Hit me up at Ned1313 on Twitter and let me know. Speaking of Server 2016, let's get into the Anexabytes. Windows Server Technical Preview 5 is out. Microsoft has released the fifth iteration of Server 2016 for your consideration. The newest release doesn't include a lot of new features, rather it continues to refine the offerings that have already been released. NanoServer has gained some additional management capabilities. Hyper-V has extended its security capabilities to lock down both the hypervisor and the guest operating systems. Windows Containers has also made some serious strides in usability and compatibility with Docker. The biggest surprise to me? Technical Preview 5. I really thought that the next iteration would be a release candidate and not another technical preview. Makes me wonder if the general availability is meant to coincide with Microsoft Ignite in September. Hopefully this thing will actually ship in 2016 and not just be a misnomer. EMC World Announcements The big highlights for EMC World included the official resignation of Joe Tucci, the renaming of EMC to Dell Technologies, and the celebration of the newest line of hardware. They are calling it the Unity Platform, but you can mostly think of it as VNX3 for the most part. Look for a more in-depth deep dive on the next podcast. AWS announces new services and breaks two billion dollars in a quarter. The AWS Summit announced new services like Amazon Inspector, which is an API to check the security profile of an application on premise before it's deployed to AWS. They also announced S3 Transfer Accelerator, which makes use of Amazon's content delivery network and edge networks to help transfer data from your on-premise location to Amazon Web Services as quickly as possible. Storage options have also proliferated on AWS to include some new options for EC2, throughput optimized HDD, and cold HDD, aka infrequent access. So not quite as slow as Glacier, but still pretty slow. Both options are meant to allow for occasional bursts of access, followed by large periods of inactivity. With over $2 billion in net income in the last quarter, AWS is still the 800-pound gorilla of cloud compute. Salesforce NA14 goes down, data lost. Nothing hurts a SaaS's credibility like downtime. But downtime with data loss could be a serious injury. Salesforce.com experienced over 12 hours of downtime for their NA14 instance. The initial outage was followed by a successful instance migration, which then flopped eight hours later. 
The larger issue is the potential data loss that followed the second failure, which Salesforce has announced that 216 minutes of data will be completely unavailable and unrecoverable. CEO Mark Benioff has offered his abject apologies on Twitter, but user confidence may be shaken and alternatives may be in the works. If you are inclined to start a third-party backup solution for Salesforce.com, now might be the right time to do it. And our last Anexabyte is Google picks Chromium OS to run Google Compute Cloud container-style VMs. Google has been eating its own dog food for quite some time when it comes to container VMs. They have been running their development and production containers on the open source OS Chromium. That makes a lot of sense since they control the entire stack. That offering is now available in the Google Compute Cloud for consumers to use as opposed to the old Debian based containers. I suppose if it's good enough for the Google, it's good enough for the Gander. That does it for the Nexabytes. Next up, I'll be talking about unikernels. Computing has changed a lot in the last 15 years, and one of the biggest shifts was thanks in large part to virtualization. The first generation of virtualization took the entire operating system and placed it on virtualized hardware. For the most part, the operating system was not even aware of the virtualization. It just assumed that the hardware presented to it was physical. What were the benefits? There's a lot of them, but the relevant benefits to this discussion are increased density, faster provisioning and startup, and the use of automation templates. The next major shift was a focusing on services and applications as opposed to servers and operating systems. After all, it is the application that end users are most concerned about, not what server or operating system it is running on. By focusing on delivering an application, particularly based on the 12-factor model, the goal is now to virtualize the application or service, not necessarily the operating system. And that's where containers and Docker entered, who took the tech industry by storm. Rather than having to worry about physical hardware emulation and operating system quirks, containers assume that the underlying OS has the proper kernel and bring their own binaries and libraries to the game. Whereas a virtual machine required a hypervisor and hardware abstraction, containers require a container host, physical or virtual, to provide them with basic operating system functions. The containers themselves are not portable, but they are meant to be stateless and extremely fast to provision. Startup times go from a minute to a couple seconds, and the container is based off an image that is source controlled and stored in a repository. So what is the next level? Back in January, Docker purchased unikernel systems. What is a unikernel? It's a specialized operating system and application package that is specifically tailored to only include those components that are absolutely essential for the application to run. This gives you many of the benefits of both containers and virtual machines. Since the unikernel is stripped down to bare essentials, the startup times and image size are comparable to containers. So unikernels can be source controlled and stored in repositories as well. Like a virtual machine, unikernels bring the whole stack with them so they are more isolated and secure than containers and create less networking and shared resource headaches. The key now is for vendors like Docker to develop the tools to create, deploy, and host unikernels. You can read more about unikernels and see a demonstration of one in action on Docker's website. With DockerCon steadily approaching, I have a sneaking suspicion we'll see some new unikernel product demos and announcements at the conference. <music> Welcome everybody. Today I'm joined by Scott Richards, the server dude at Hewlett Packard. And now it's not just Hewlett Packard anymore, it's HPE, right? It's uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise now. We're two separate entities. Excellent. And and how are you today, Scott? I'm fine. I'm actually looking quite, after I saw the uh, amount of technological equipment that you brought in, I'm actually better now. You're better? Okay. You're better. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's uh, it's all still a little new to me too, but uh, you know we'll get through this together, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, what's your role at at HP and and 
you know, what, what are the things you get to do, work with, play with? Well, I've been with HP now for uh, 22 years, and um, I've done many, many different jobs within HP, uh, and formerly a compact person, one of the first compact people in the Philadelphia, the, uh, Philadelphia area. Uh, my role now is uh, working with channel partners around uh, enabling them with our server and solutions uh, in all different categories, uh, as well as converted and integrated systems and hybrid cloud solutions. But very focused on channel partners, like my premier, uh, this is my shameless plug for Annexinet, my <laughs> premier partner. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed is we're entering the era of software-defined like everything. The software-defined networks, software-defined storage, um, you name it, it's software-defined, right? Absolutely. So, and so how, do you, how have you seen the industry embracing this trend? Um, I think it's just a, a key initiative to, uh, to drive what I would consider you know, where we're going in life. We have so much data that we track anymore uh, that the performance of the systems can't keep up. Essentially, if you're, uh, you know, your, your driving goal is to uh, take the data that you have and understand what it is and, and actually make it into usable data, the more software definition between um, not only the hardware, uh, but the applications and the APIs that drive both the hardware and the applications uh, is going to make uh, things much quicker today and much more higher performance and much more usable data. Um, you know, if you talk to most customers today, they say that 80% of the data they capture, uh, they have no idea what it is and, and still not usable. So software defined uh, is just the way of the future to get to that data and drive, uh, you know, usable results. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to bust out your crystal ball. Okay. And where do you see infrastructure in general? Because I'm an infrastructure guy. That's mostly what I do. Uh, where do you see infrastructure go over the next three years? What are the big trends? Well, I mean, I think, you know, you guys certainly know as well as I do, uh, uh, the, w the word change is ever constant in our world, and it's the only thing that's constant in our <laughs> world. Um, so the reality for me is, you know, infrastructure will change. It'll be hybrid in some ways. It'll be off-prem. It'll be on-prem. You know, you'll have to obviously manage what regulatory commitments you have in each vertical industry that you have. But the, the reality is you're going to think you'll see hardware much more tightly interconnected, uh, going back to your original statement of software defined, um, and driving the capabilities to be elastic, uh, bursting, and have the capabilities of, of you know, giving you the management tools that you need in a much more reliable and, and sort of single window, pane of glass window to, to drive that infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, the the infamous single pane of glass. Yes, uh, I, I I've heard about that so many times, um, but I've never actually seen it. Yeah, well, you know, for you guys that are the true technological, hands-on guys that do the day-to-day -day infrastructure stuff, uh, we know we try to t sell you on that every single year. But the reality is, you know, that's a goal of ours: uh, firmware updates, um, you know, maintenance windows. Uh, we want to get to a point where maintenance windows, there are no more maintenance windows, where we can shut down one side of the system, upgrade the firmware, turn the other system you know, down, bring the other one back up, and actually have everything running where it is fairly transparent to you that the firmware and maintenance windows sort of go away. Now, is that a nirvana at this point in time? I'd say still yes, but it's a driving goal from the engineering side to get to that sort of nonstop resiliency that everybody needs today. I, I think we're definitely getting closer. I've noticed that a lot, a lot fewer things require downtime, and especially with virtualization, you can shift workloads dynamically. So if there is something you need to do on the hardware, you can evacuate all the the running processes on that and do what you need to do and move it back. Absol um, absolutely. So thank goodness for virtualization, right? Yep. And what happens when bare metal becomes lower cost in virtualization than the software, and you build virtualization right into the hardware? So, you know, some products today like Moonshot actually have the capability of providing a VDI solution in bare metal with really no virtualization software leaning on, leaning on top of it all run by hardware alone. Right. That's an interesting solution that I saw. At the, they're called cassettes, right? The cartridges. The cartridges. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cassettes were back in my day, I think, <laughs> right around 1970. Okay, so it, but it, it looks kind of like an eight track. It a absolutely bit. does. Uh, that's a perfect uh, analysis there of uh, you know of what I look at them as. But they're hot pluggable, mm -hmm. um, very very workload centric. It could be for telecom, 
could be for service providers and static and dynamic content. And um, in uh, some VDI solutions that we have as an app server or for a VDI type of server. But you know the, the cool thing about Moonshot, it's a very low processor, uh, power processors such as ARMS or Atoms. In that space, there's about 35 different uh, processor companies that make those products. And they run around somewhere in the range of about 6% to 10% of power utilization that an x86 server does today. Uh, but again, very workload specific. Uh, and all of HPE actually runs off of Moonshot today. Really? Absolutely. No, H I did not know that. That's yep. that's pretty neat. Yep. So you, you're eating your own dog food, as it were. Absolutely. Okay. In that vein of what HP is using these days, um, I've heard rumors. I've read little things. Um, you know, every every once in a while something leaks out about the machine. Uh, I even saw a diagram of it. Uh, is there anything you can tell me about the machine? Anything new that's come out in the last six months about it? Well, um, the machine, uh, I think, uh, I probably have the same image as you do. We've been talking about it for quite a long time. So I think we're going to actually stand a fully functional machine in beta use finally this year. Wow. Um, so uh, before that, you'll have, um, I think, other questions that will lead into the machine. But, you know, we've gone through 2006 from HP Blades to today, which we still have more lifespan in that. And now we've just introduced the next technology, which is composable infrastructure, um, which is Project Synergy, and that'll be shipping very shortly. And that's the next step in sort of soft-defined compute storage and networking, all very tightly integrated. But the beautiful thing about Synergy and Composable it has tie-ins to future upgrades into the machine. Um, so you know we're looking at at some point in time having the machine up and running, as pro you know being productized by 2021. I think uh, my belief is this year at Discover, uh, which we run every year for customers and channel partners alike, uh, we'll actually have some working versions of the machines at uh, Discover. So you know the essential characteristics of the machine. Uh, basically, to, to put it in a small paragraph is, you know, a sort of converging memory and storage. You know, we know that, uh, you know, every tire is being monitored, how many times in rotation, every Fitbit, how many steps you take, um, your shopping habits, which we already know. Uh, people are, you know, uh, it's three and a half terabytes for a three-hour flight of storage for every flight is recorded of every detail, engines, um, cabin temperature, pressures, you name it, um, weather characteristics of that flight. And we know that the amount of data that we're processing is overwhelming today. And Moore's Law is starting to shrink uh, or you know, almost come to a halt. So at some point in time, we're going to have to rethink on how we process uh, information. So the whole goal of the machine, and the funny thing is um, being a product again of this of the 60s and the 70s, I think Pink Floyd every time they say the machine. But um, really, I, I believe you know where we're going is an all-memory type of solution that will have the characteristics of non-volatile memory mm -hmm. and be able to have these very fluid and shared resource pools of processor, or let me say compute, uh, and memory that can be reallocated very quickly on the fly to uh, afford specific characteristics of the type of data that we're trying to mine and actually create into what again I always say is usable data for that vertical market that we're you know whoever's working on that system at that time so you know it's going to be very local memory it'll provide a low latency and high performance and then very heterogeneous computer compute resources distributed closer to the data so you know making things smarter um, running everything in memory, everything going on the fastest bus humanly possible, and adding things in like non-volatile RAM, uh, as well as photonics. And photonics, uh, you know, takes Ethernet to the next step. At, uh, instead of 100 gig, you'll start to think about terabyte speeds for uh, photonics. And by the way, in Synergy and Composable, you'll have the uh, uh, component connectors already built in for photonic connectors in that next step. Okay, yeah, sort of marching it from where fiber terminates now in the back of the server. A absolutely. It's, can we get that light deeper and deeper into the infrastructure? Because the light's always going to be faster than copper, right? A absolutely. And, uh, you know, we have a couple senior fellows in the company. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Brad Mays, and uh, he's the guy that looks out at compute 
20 to 30 years and you know strategizes and in workshops and uh, and he's the guy that's you know see I always ask him you know why do I need a, a gig a network throughput speeds and he goes it's because you know the data is just we have no way of processing what we need to today and 20 years from now the data will be you know incrementally much more uh, how do we do that unless we fix the current processing and compute problems that we have trying to make again that data into usable functionality right it seems like right now the biggest constraint is storage right yep storage is well you know again so uh, great comment there in the sense that you know we've just surpassed with the three-par storage product we actually now i think as of last week now sell more all flash arrays than we actually sell rotational so yeah. not not to say the big bad word emc but at their most recent emc world their big thing was this is the year of all flash absolutely all of their arrays are now have like an all flash option even their like vnxe i think has an all flash option um, and I know that the three par um, right. also has its all flash options, and other storage vendors have all been doing the all flash thing too. You know, the cost of flash keeps coming down, absolutely, and the need for that access of speed keeps going up. I know I, I've seen the the other connection technologies so instead of fiber channel now going to um, like InfiniBand with NV was it NVRE or yeah, something non volatile, yeah, yeah. Um, and connections, uh, remote direct memory connections between Absolutely. servers and all that kind of thing. So yeah. I think that, that all feeds back into the machine, yeah. right? Yeah, it all comes into the next step. It's, you know, I think Flash, and you know, I, and Flash is just, you know, not Flash to everybody, right? So in the having Flash is one thing, but it's how you use your algorithms, how you compress, how you use the performance, and helping, you know, how, how you're building it. And as always, you know, Intel has a piece of that pie. You know, they would like, uh, an ASIC in an, uh, in an EMC product as well as an an, an HP product, uh, they don't like the fact that the three par solution is uh, is strictly uh, an HP solution that way. But it's what differentiates us. It's the algorithms uh, and how we build that storage to be performance optimized, and why we lead. We were the only storage company last year that actually grew. The other nine that I can think of as the majority players in that space uh, lost market share. And I think it's because of the, you know, the engineers and the technology that's actually built into the three-par product today. Yeah, so there's definitely still a place for custom silicon. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I guess the machine might not even be silicon. Who knows? It's, it's a mystery. Yeah, and you'll <laughs> still see it. You know, again, I think next year you'll see a working version sometime this year in HP Labs. At Discover, they always have an HP Labs area. And hopefully next year in some of our uh, briefing centers we'll have a uh, an upper running version of the machine uh, in Palo Alto and Houston as well as uh, New York City. Okay, so you mentioned uh, composable architecture and I've definitely heard that term thrown out but I don't really quite understand com what, it, what it refers to. Can you sort of break it down for me? My belief is that composable is just the next generation of hyperconverged, right? So hyperconverged is very tightly integrated storage network and compute does a lot of very cool things, but if you look at really where it sits in the marketplace, it really is sort of a small, medium business. You have to do a lot of stacking. They're auto-intelligent. Um, they have auto-cluster, uh, and they become much smarter. They do a lot of orchestration. They do a lot of automation. Well, this is the next step. You know, I think uh, in our world, people define uh, new technology words, so it just drives marketplace. So I'll give you the word from Gartner, and the, Gar the word of the week is bimodal. So bimodal is really part of what we call the idea economy. And uh, being able to still run your transactional stuff that's been used every day, which is your payroll, your manufacturing, your ERP systems, um, not a lot changes there, maybe some upgrades. But now we're at a point where, you know, if you just go to uh, iTunes or Google Play, um, there's 3,000 new commercial applications a week for mobile products today, and they're collecting wow. data. So um, now, you know, the CIO used to be a, a necessary evil, and IT used to be a necessary evil to drive every company. But that was the drive word processing, the applications that they needed for these things. Now IT is now absolutely uh, an edge, a part of why I'm going to be better than my competitor in this space, and IT has to be part of the business process 
uh, because if I have technology that serves me well versus my competitor, I, I hopefully will be in the lead in that space. So by modal, you're going to see, uh, you know, DevOps groups grow from one or two guys to maybe a group of 10 or 20. They're going to take more risk, but they're going to roll out apps in seconds, not days, not weeks. I always read in a Fortune 500 company, the average time it takes for uh, an application to roll out to be in production is somewhere truly in the world of 60 to 90 days. But now companies can't do that anymore. They need to be able to be competitive, whether it's in retail, whether it's in automotive, energy, uh, health care. You know, how do I get my doctors and nurses the tools that they need quickly? And that's going to happen where you have one segment of your IT to be very, very agile, efficient, uh, developmental and being able to do it in the same system so composable is really part of our synergy project which we'll be shipping this year okay very cool so it's again going back to the software defined so you're defining infrastructure via software absolutely and there's three major parts of composable that tie exactly into what you said Ned which is a single API so you know what Everybody wants is that nirvana. I can write code that'll touch every piece of my infrastructure by a single API. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, hopefully we get to that point. It's working now. When we start shipping that product, you know, cover all the different parts of the infrastructure in Synergy. Um, same way as um, the machine, uh, very, very fluid pools of resources, which will be compute, you know, I.O. Um, and storage and networking or, you know, I.O. included in that. Um, very tightly software defined. So, you know, we're going to use a RESTful API to be able to drive with web scale type of performance and also have the capabilities of being very, very tightly integrated, software defined, as you say, and having those fluid uh, pools of resources where I can basically say, I need 30 apps tomorrow running out in the field because of this promotion, or I just, do an, I just did an M&A and I need to tie in their systems to my system very quickly. How do I do that? Uh, we think Composable is the next step above and beyond software to find. Uh, it, it sounds great. And uh, I will say, I mean, some of the advancements that have been made with OneView, um, the new management software for 3PAR, and now I, I think it can also tie into some of the networking switches from HP and some other third parties. Um, yeah, being able to just use PowerShell, because that's one of my favorite tools, to write to these RESTful APIs and get things done uh, is just fantastic. And the more that you can templatize and automate the processes, the, the happier I am. Because ultimately, uh, I'd rather be doing something else than typing out lines of, uh, or manually configuring anything. Uh, absolutely. And I, you know, and that seems to be the goal. You know, uh, when you talk to CIOs or chief technology officers today, they basically said, I, I want to manage my data. I want my data to be usable data that can be a competitive edge. And the other, you know, and CIOs want to manage URLs uh, and their web services more than hardware. So, you know, we're again, that software defined as well as the hardware being integrated into uh, a very unique and eliminating one of the key factors. You know, 50% uh, downtime today is, is really pointed to one thing. And I hate to say who that is, but it's us, human beings. So, you know, that happens because of human error and mistakes. Somebody mm -hmm. pulls the wrong plug, somebody presses the wrong, wrong keystroke, and things just don't always work as well. So one of the things that you talked about that had brought up with OneView was to do those studies with customers as well as channel partners on what the average human being does in IT tasking today and informational services, and try to put that into a best practice so you have those templates, you have those fluid pools of resources when you want to do it, and everything is built the same way every single time. Taking those human tasks, uh, from what Gartner says today, about 20% every year of human, auto, of human orchestration that occurs is now being built into an infrastructure. So just think of it, 20% of that average guy that's out there doing whatever he does every day from a human you know, statistic, putting a plug in, turning the lights on, pulling a tape cartridge out, backing up his storage, is now going to just be all automated. So at one point in time, it'll be one guy running a data center that maybe 20 people did at one time. If you're a sysadmin and you said, you know, change is the only constant in our industry, what what are the skills that, you know, Joe sysadmin should be uh, should be bulking up on right now if he, if he wants to keep his job? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing because I do believe in this world that there's 20 IT jobs for every college IT major grad that comes out of school. 
So I don't believe that opportunities will be less, but I do think that that CIO, that chief technology officer, that chief digital officer or security officer will reallocate those resources to be specialists for specific needs that need to occur. But a lo- again, some of those menial manual tasks that weren't done, um, you know, today, you know, I, I can plug and play a hyperconverged solution in and have it produ- producing, you know, production VMs within 15 minutes with one guy. And that's five clicks. So he's an IT generalist. He's the ditto guy from school. He's the guy that does, you know, all he needs to do is follow five of the instructions and he's up and running. From a sysadmin perspective, uh, my belief is that you're, you're going to see them specialize in areas of data mining, uh, security, uh, digitizing their their uh, enterprise because everybody's going to be digital at some time in space. So those guys won't lose jobs. They'll grow in their jobs and they'll just become more specialty under the hood type of human beings. Okay. But yeah, they should definitely be on the lookout for the new technologies and embracing them and not saying, hey, you know, I really like my VT100 uh, green screen console and that's all I'm ever going to use. Absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, you know, if, if they're still stuck at that time, uh, then maybe there's no hope. But I do believe today most of these guys know where we're going. You know, we know that uh, you see the security issues that, that we have today. That's a major portion of uh, of every company's, you know, to address those things. You know, well, who's attacking me? How am I attacked? How do I prevent those attacks? Ransomware. Uh, and that has changed IT strategy in a, a number of ways. Mm-hmm. So, And then, again, I go just to the basics of data. I just see us collecting and collecting and collecting, and yet it's still unusable. It's unstructured. It's still raw. How do we mine that data to where it is usable? And companies that are figuring out those ways to make it into functional, usable data to for a competitive edge are the ones that are winning. You know, if you look at the the top 20 companies today and in uh, on Wall Street, and you look at the top 20 companies only 15 years ago, you'll find that most of the 20 companies out there today have a very strong IT focus, and that is the competitive edge versus the 20 that weren't there or are not there anymore 20 years ago. Right. So IT is not something you just do. It's it has to be one of your core competencies Absolutely. now if you want to be competitive. Absolutely. It's yeah. The, digitalization of of the enterprise and uh, if it's not part of why it makes me a better company um, then somebody's you know living certainly in the past yeah Uh, you mentioned security and um, with the Internet of Things and all this data that's coming out and then ransomware and 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 there's uh, i think security is becoming a much bigger concern is is there anything uh, any big trends you see to address the security issues that are out there today well it's very interesting i mean i mean uh, from uh, since meg whitman's been here one of the things that meg has done a great job is reinvesting into hp labs as well as m a and in growth areas and we all know security is a growth area. So, uh, you know, with the acquisition of uh, Aruba uh, and some of the software tools that Aruba has from Fortify to uh, a lot of other tools that we're using in the, in the security space, what we've really ramped, we actually have a cybersecurity uh, data center uh, and lab in Palo Alto now that we actually have CISOs come in and spend a day with our CISOs about how to prevent attacks how to understand attacks. And I'll give you a good, uh, I'll give you just sort of a, a quick story. One of our CISOs uh, that I know pretty well uh, was the, for, the former Washington Post CISO, and he told me the story that one night uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation called him and said, hey, you have a breach. And 3 a.m. in the morning, he got his team together. He had an emergency team. It took him two weeks, and you know he thought he found a breach and uh, called the FBI agent up and said, um, we fixed it. He got, and the FBI agent basically said, uh, no, you haven't. <laughs> so, uh, you know, team bat went back to work. They fixed the one breach that the FBI was not really aware of. Uh, came back two or three weeks later, said, oh, we found the second breach. And the FBI guy as well said, no, you didn't. So for the third time, uh, you know, he finally fixed it. It was uh, a foreign nation. Uh, and uh, the, the FBI really couldn't help him because it was an ongoing legal case that was, you know, ongoing. But, you know, people think that they're they're not prone or they're in an in- industry that may be not be vulnerable and how wrong that is. I mean, everybody, we have, you know, in our center today, you know, we could show you basically where, they, where the attacks come from. 
um, you know, where they go, how they're rerouted, what they look like, how they're hidden. And so from, from our perspective, uh, security is going to be a major play, not only in the, the software side, but as far as taking some of that software and making it technology uh, integrated into a, in a hardware fashion where you have some hardware defenses built in to protect yourself from ongoing attacks as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard the Internet of Things called the Internet of Insecure Things. Yeah, well. And, uh, you know, I guess that just happens when there's rapid growth and, and rapid uh, development happening. Security is not the first thing they're thinking of. And so now they have to go back and say, oh, wow, so I left all this stuff open just to get it to work, and now I need to clamp it down. How do I do that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, and again, uh, so I still think security is not at the head of the priorities for most companies today. That is changing, obviously. Uh, I just saw, the I think, the World Bank, $88 million offloaded into a Eastern European accounts from an email, originally an email. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of things that uh, we need to do. We have a really good security practice now. We continue to build in the security space, and the security tools are out there. And if you just go under HP, uh, HPE slash go, slash security you'll see all the uh, offerings you have but you know what i would tell you as you guys know uh, being one of our premier premier partners is just reach out to us we'll bring the right people in to help you with security studies all right thank you a pure public cloud is probably not a good fit for most um, businesses yep. it's really uh some sort of hybrid of the two some things on prem some things up in the cloud i mean very small businesses going all cl all public cloud might make sense, yep. um, but once you go to a certain size, bringing some of that back in-house makes sense. And um, there was that very interesting story of Dropbox, who for a long time were all in AWS, everything. Um, that's where they got their roots. They took advantage of S3 storage when it first came out and built a whole platform on it. And now they have taken all of that and brought all of it in-house in their own data centers and basically off of the public cloud entirely. Absolutely. And I'm sure they didn't do that on a whim. No, I think that was cost related. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And maybe to a certain degree uh, security related, but definitely, uh, you know, they had to see some sort of major cost savings. Uh, Apple's doing the same thing right now. Yeah. So, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely a few other companies that have done that sort of, hey, we went all in on this public cloud. Ooh, maybe we're not saving as much money as we thought. Let's let's try going hybrid, and you know we have that bursting capability if we ever need it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a very interesting perspective. Yet you know it's such a new thing, and the rush is there. And we're all going to do it, and then all of a sudden, you know, first of all, you know, if you're in pharmaceutical or you're in financial, you have regulatory rules around what you do and what could stay on and what could you could stay off. And I still think the SLAs in public cloud are still formulating because nobody's figured everything out yet. Even though I think AWS and Google and Microsoft have done a very good job, you know, the first time, you know, there's a major breach in security, what does that kind of do? You know, what, how does that affect you? Do you have your data replicated on site? Can I get access to it? Is it completely gone? And I know these are things that they've addressed in a lot of different ways, but, you know, we, I still think the, the maturation of public cloud has becomes much more leaning towards hybrid. Uh, as we go on. Right. I, I, there was that uh, most recent outage from Salesforce.com, and uh, they were down for, what, 12 hours? 12 hours. 12 yeah. hours, and they lost uh, about four hours of data, I think. Yep. It, it keeps changing a little bit, but essentially uh, they did lose uh, a chunk of data, and they had all these safeguards in place and fail-safes, and, you know... Uh -huh. One of the things I think you guys have done well here at Annexinet is you've partnered with a company uh, called uh, Cloud Genera. And so Cloud Genera basically gives you an in-depth report on your overall cost of what's effectively able to go to public, what should stay in-house. And it actually is so cool because it looks at your industry, it manages all your regulatory rules and, and uh, procedures. So it actually said, okay, I'm in healthcare. And then when you run the report, it says these are the things that you have to have, must stay in house, or I'm in financial, or I'm in energy. But they do a very extensive, almost 50 page report on public private hybrid that I find they do a better job of the homework than most companies ever really put, put forth when they think about going to public. So it's something that your customers certainly should engage with you guys and have a, you know, do a Cloud Genera initiative at their site. 
Yeah, I mean, developing a cloud strategy is key for all businesses right now. Uh, and it's really just part of a, a bigger IT strategy. Like I said, you need to have that competitive edge for IT and you need a strategy behind that. It's not just blindly going, oh, public cloud sounds awesome or OpenStack sounds awesome or, or whatever. It's let's develop, what, where do we actually want to be? What strategic initiatives are right. we trying to accomplish with this? And, in what, and what effective results to our company occur because we're doing those, that strategy, absolutely. So it is, it is very interesting. I see more and more people being a little bit more cautious on developing, you know, again, you know, now we have the world of, you know, CXOs, CDOs, CISOs, you name it. And obviously you're gonna have the uh, chief cloud, um, you know, d department as well. So, um, but we're starting to see, um, you know, ro shadow cloud happening, rogue cloud happening. People that have access to AWS where, oh, you know, they didn't know this department was running out there and they probably shouldn't be. So again, I think there's still, you know, some of the rules and procedures have to be reined in and governance has to be provided. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we are coming up on time. Last question, my favorite question to ask. Uh -oh. uh, don't think about this too hard. Just first thing that pops in your mind, your favorite 80s movie. Well, I'd have to probably say uh, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, okay. Yeah, Forrest Gump. I, I, love, I love Forrest Gump only for the fact that Tom Hanks uh, showed you what you know, the goodness in human beings are. Well, that is a delightful uh, note to go out on. Scott Richards, the server dude at HPE, thank you so much for joining us. Ned, it's been a pleasure, and I'd love it to is. come back and do this again with you at some time. All right, sounds great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Special thanks go out to our guest, Scott Richards, the server dude, for taking the time to talk with us and share his thoughts on the future of infrastructure and servers. Thanks to Catherine and Patty for helping pull this together as always. Thanks to Lee Rosevier and Professor Click for providing the music for Anexapod. Thanks to Anexanet for helping me produce the podcast. If you're looking for a company to help you with your digital, strategy, or technology needs, then I would recommend reaching out to Anexanet to see how they can help. Anexapod is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, which means you can share it, but don't sell or change it. And finally, thank you to you for tuning in and listening. Without you, I would just be a lunatic talking in a room to myself. If you'd like to comment on the podcast or contact me in some other way, my Twitter handle is Ned1313, or you can use the hashtag Anexapod. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, IT moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you can miss it. <laughs> <laughs>